So the objective transformation of reality, and we'll just abbreviate this as objective transformation of reality, OTR. And this is going to be the key term, right? The objective transformation of reality, and I'll explain in a little bit why um, the term objective is sort of given primacy in Freire's account of the pedagogy of the oppressed. Okay, so the first bullet point says that the process of changing the process, right, this, this transformation, the process of changing the oppressor-oppressed contradiction, right, and we just saw what that was, the process of changing this contradiction is resolved through the objective transformation of reality, right, the OTR. Um, so, anytime we are talking about the OO contradiction, so we can say that the, the OO contradiction is resolved by means of the OTR, right? So that's the statement that we can make. The OO contradiction in Freer is resolved by means of the uh, objective transformation of reality. The contradiction, the oppressor-oppressed contradiction, which we saw before, is resolved by means of the objective transformation of reality. We need to objectively transform reality. What in the world does that mean? Of all the things in free air, to be honest with you, and this is like, you know, we've only, we're only a couple of pages into chapter one, I would argue that this is one of the hardest things to understand. Um, in attempting to teach this to students for the first time, it's hard to really understand what Freire means by the objective transformation of reality because it's not what you think, right? Um, so, for example, let me take something that I can actually rip. All right. Imagine, imagine that, uh, these are my old notes, right? Imagine that this is something that I objectively want to transform. I have one sheet of paper, and I want to objectively transform reality. No one's going to deny the existence, probably except for Berkeley, right? But no one's going to, no rational person's going to deny the existence of this external thing, right? Let's be like uh, G.E. Moore and say that we know that this thing exists, right? So this thing exists as objectively real. And um, Freire is giving primacy, he's giving, he's giving emphasis to verifiability, right? The, the attempt to verify this transformation in reality. Well, if I do this, what was one now has become two, and I can verify the transformation because I can quantify that what was one is now two. There's one and there's two, right? So that there has been some visible objective transformation in this reality. This is not what Freer is talking about at all. He's not talking about objective transformation of reality in terms of what I just demonstrated. So any account that says that uh, Freer is talking about sort of quantification or verification in that sense doesn't get what Freer is attempting to do. He is not saying that. His discussion of the objective transformation of reality of the OTR is far more complicated than that, and it's a result of a dialectical relationship between the, the oppressor and the oppressed group. And I'm going to try and explain this because it's, it's sort of difficult to get your mind around. That seems very easy. What he's doing is not that. Okay. Um, again, emphasis on the objective, right? So we understand that we need to, I need to be able to explain what he means by objective by the end of this, this particular series of videos, right? Um, the notion of objectivity requires subjectivity. The notion of objectivity requires subjectivity? What does that mean? Well, typically, we think of it in two senses, right? We think of there is a perceiver, right? And there is an external world. And I see an external world, right? And we'll say that this is objective, right? There's me and there's stuff outside of me, right? And that's typically how your sort of introductory to philosophy usually begins. Perceiver, stuff in the world, right? I, I'm a perceiver and I see the cat is on the mat. Okay, cool. Sort of, I recognize the objective reality of this thing, and I say that this thing is not part of me, therefore there must be this thing, external world, right? And this is complicated, and I can't get through all of the complications that mount out of this presupposition, but that's a general account. The antithesis to this is to be subjective, right? And to be subjective is to say that, well, really what ends up happening is that all that really exists is, is me and my mind, and everything else in the external world is not really part of the external world, it's a condition of my faculty of perception, and Berkeley notoriously introduces this argument, right? Um, so I can be um, an ideal subjectivist in a sense, right? I can believe that all that really exists is mind, 
and that everything in the external world refers back to me, or I can believe that, you know, I can make the, 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 the camera sense that you know, there really is no me, um, I'm just another one of the furnishings of the external world. All that exists is sort of stuff. And there's a debate that goes in philosophy back and forth. Um, uh, continental philosophers, to their credit, have sort of done away with the, the subject-object distinction, right? This, this idea of the subject-object distinction is antiquated, right? It really isn't this, this idea, this sort of mutual exclusion that you're either all object or you're all subject. And to his credit, what uh, Paulo Freire does is he, he refers to that sense, that philosophical tradition which um, denies the subject-object distinction, right? It's more complicated than just being subject-object. And we'll talk about what that complication is uh, in a second. All right, so the notion of uh, objectivity requires subjectivity, right? So we'll talk about that in a second. I want to return to that. Deni the denial of subjective reality leads to objectivism, right? So if we deny subject reality, then this objective uh, distinction turns into the technical term, which is objectivism, right? B-J-E-C-T-I-V-I-S-M, right? So this subjective experience, this subjective experience turns into objectivism, right? And objectivism is basically the claim that um, the external world is really all that there is, right? It's just stuff in the world, like furnishings in the universe, in a sense. There is no subjective I experience proper. Um, okay, well, so we, we, understand, we understand that. However, um, the denial of the objective reality, right? If you're a subjectivist, right? The, uh, the denial of objective reality, according to Freire, and he's right, leads to solipsism, right? right? The denial of um, objective experience leads to solipsism. And solipsism is problematic because all that exists is my mind. So the fact that you're watching this video now and you have your own beliefs about, I don't know, the, about my lecture or whatever it is that I'm saying now, um, it's impossible to prove that you are not a, a faculty of my imagination, right? That I'm not caught up in sort of this uh, self-indulgent, almost narcissistic, perpetual, ontological self-reflection. That all of this is just a figment of my imagination, right? That, that's a little hokey, right? And solipsism is a huge problem, right? So we want to deny both. You don't want to say that you're an objectivist because I feel that I exist and that, that I have an ability to choose and I have freedom. I also don't want to accept uh, solipsism because I believe that, like Moore says, that I have a left hand, right? I want to believe that this is something that's real, right? And it's, it's, it's not part of my mind. Um, so Freire is very, very, very thoughtful in incorporating, it seems like a very, very minor um, contribution to the oppressor-oppressed dialectic, but we'll see how he incorporates this idea of subjectivity and objectivity into the dialectical relationship between the subject, uh, between the uh, oppressor-oppressed uh, um, relationship. Remember, again, we're trying to um, transform, right, transform this OO contradiction, and that transformation has to be um, objectively verified. Is denied if you can. No, uh, it has to be objectively. Verifiable. If it's not objectively verifiable, then it's, it's the whole point of this is, is a failure, right? Okay. Um, the objective transformation of reality occurs in a dialectical relationship between subjective and objective reality. So in some sense, what we need to do, right, what we need to do is we need to recognize that it's more like this, right? It's a biconditional, right? It's not a disjunctive relationship. It's not either, either objective reality or subjective reality, right? That when we're talking about objective reality and subjective reality, we're really saying that these things are one and the same, right? That they're, they're, they're two halves to one whole. We have to make sense of this, this dialectic, this dialectical relationship, and insofar as we are able to make sense of this biconditional rather than this disjunctive account, then we rid ourselves, we free ourselves of this, this, this false uh, subject-object distinction, right? And he needs to rid himself of this false subject-object distinction for reasons that we'll see uh, later.